OnTrack is a behavioral healthcare company that identifies members who need more care and treats them for up to 52 weeks. With therapist-led care, members return to health. Payers get a return on investment. Help is here. OnTrack. Better together. Find out more at OnTrack-inc.com. Hello and welcome to What You Missed This Week. I'm Joe Weisenthal. This is the podcast that has the best and most interesting interviews from the Daily Market Close Show that I co-anchor with Scarlett Fu, Caroline Hyde, and Romaine Bostic on Bloomberg TV. It's called What You Miss. Our aim is to take you beyond the headlines and bring you unique perspectives on the week's top stories and, well, those that you may have just missed. It's the perfect way to kick off your weekend. This week, Peloton reported first quarter earnings reporting a narrower than expected quarterly loss and a strong revenue forecast for next year. But that wasn't enough for investors. After starting early trading up more than 7%, shares tumbled as investors grew frustrated because of the focus on growth over profitability. We spoke with CEO John Foley after the earnings came out and asked him how he planned to stay disciplined about his growth plans and convince the investor base to like it. Yeah, I think one way we show it is to get to profitability, which we are profitable in our U.S. bike business. So we got to profitability. We are still profitable with that business. And now we are investing in new future growth drivers, international, the U.K., Canada, Germany next month. Uh, We're investing in new categories with our treadmill. We're investing in our digital business, new content facilities, both here in New York and in London. So these are investments that we're excited about. But our core business is profitable. The the, the headline coming out of this morning, to your point, Caroline, triple digit top line growth and single digit EBITDA loss and uh, um, closing losses um, from last from Q1 last year or Q1 last year. So we're feeling great about not just the prioritization of growth, but it's, it, for us, it's also prioritization, prioritizing profitability. Um, it's not an either or for this business because the fundamental model is so gorgeous. So there's still questions, though, of how you achieve that. I mean, as a public company, you know that Wall Street analysts can be sort of res- relentless in, in asking for more and asking for for something new. We have an exercise bike. We have a treadmill. What type of products and what type of services do you have planned to sort of expand on what you've already built? Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, we have a lot in R&D and we have a lot of things planned in the coming years and we're excited about it. And them. you can tell us all that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but to be honest, we don't need, I mean, our again, our core bike business is profitable. Mm-hmm. Um, it will be profitable over the you know the next couple of years in the, in the UK and Canada. And our uh, our tread business is subscale from a manufacturing perspective, so mm-hmm. it has lower margins. But as it gets to scale, the margins and the, the unit economics in that business go up as we get the uh, the cost of goods sold down through manufacturing scale. So we don't need to launch more products or more platforms mm-hmm. or no more geographies to that point to get to profitability. Uh, we may choose to invest in those things over time, but it's not something needed for profitability. Do you have to lower prices or we've got free trials being offered? How fierce is competition and how hard is it to ensure that you win the scale in these new markets such as Germany? Yeah, for for better or worse right now, we don't feel like we have a true competitor, um, a like-minded competitor, as it were, a a tech-based, well-capitalized company. So um, it's always been a question of should you lower the price on the Peloton bike? I founded the company with my co-founder seven and a half years ago. It's been incredibly academic to to think about lowering the price. When you're doubling the company in size every year, including last quarter that we announced this morning, 103% top line growth. It's somewhat academic to think about lowering the price when you're making them or when you're selling them as fast as you can make them at the current price point, right? So we feel pretty good. The value that our members see when they buy one, and they can buy one for $58 a month, and then you would divide it by two because your live-in partner also rides. So that's $29 a month for the hardware and then the $39 a month for the subscription. But for a household that's less than $50 per adult for unlimited, fantastic boutique fitness classes at the best location with the best bike with the best software and the best instructors in the world it's a pretty good value proposition at the current price point there's still though this big hardware component to your business getting that physical bike uh, into the hands of people not only are you talking about a price point that is high for some people you're also dealing with people 
who have maybe have space constraints, particularly sure. folks who maybe live in a city like New York. Um, when you sort of look at your apps and you look at some of the services that maybe don't necessarily require the hardware purchase, do you think that could become a bigger and more important part of your business? Uh, it could be, mm -hmm. and if it does, I'm excited about it. We have a, uh, a fantastic new uh, head of our digital business named Karina Kogan, and, and I think she's going to uh, surprise people with that business, to your point. the platform uh, We are platform agnostic with our content, so if you are one of the 34 million people with a treadmill in your basement today, mm -hmm. uh, Americans, um, 34 million and then or bikes I think there's 15 million bikes in homes today you don't need to buy our hardware download our app throw it up to your 60 inch television screen in your home gym or your basement and consume our content take our classes tomorrow so we are excited if that becomes a, a big deal for consumers interestingly about the infrastructure or the, the hardware requirement you've been making some acquisitions some interesting ones to ha either make future products built in-house more yep. an easier thing yep. or manufacturing to That's own right. the supply That's chain right. Are you going to continue to do that? And wh why do you need to do that? Sort of Apple doesn't do it. Yeah, Foxconn. we don't need to do it. That's a good point. The Apple does not own Foxconn. Um, we decided, nor do we own our, or we are interested in owning our contract manufacturers for the tablets as well. So we have similar um, uh, manufacturers to uh, Foxconn making our tablets. Mm. That is a very mature industry, and we have very mature contract manufacturing partnerships on the tablets. For, uh, for the bikes and the treads, it's a less, there's been less investment in that category in the last 20 years. Mm. You know, Foxconn is an incredibly well-capitalized business, as you can imagine. For us, we bought one of our two um, core bike manufacturing partners. Um, we're excited to help them invest. This is Tonic you're talking about? This is Tonic, about? exactly. Okay. To, yeah. For scale, um, over time, it will give us structural cost advantages if a competitor does come into our category. So we can make uh, better bikes uh, faster at more scale than the industry's ever seen, quite frankly, and we're very excited about it. We're also excited about our existing other contract manufacturer. We will always be dual-sourced for all sorts sorts of reasons, so we're, we're excited about that acquisition. But Caroline, to your point, um, we bought a music uh, platform last year. We bought the contract manufacturer. We bought this, uh, uh, call it an aqua hire for hardware and software engineers out uh, in the valley. Um, Gossamer. Couple, Gossamer a couple months ago. Um, that's an incredible group of software en or, you know, engineers that we're very excited about. We're going to be opportunistic. We're going to be smart. Um, we will use M&A where we think it's smart, uh, but we, you know, 90 plus percent of our growth is going to come from organic organic investments from the proceeds of our, of our IPO last month. We now have a $1.5, $1.4 billion balance sheet, and we look forward to investing, um, as per our earlier conversation, in future growth drivers. So that brings us back, though, to profitability. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, in, in the past, a lot of companies have sort of gotten pretty long leashes to make those investments, and investors are willing to go along with the ride as long as, no pun intended, as long as that <laughs> revenue growth was there. It, it seems that in recent months, there's been a somewhat shift in investor sentiment, and they want to see not only that revenue growth, but really that profit growth. Do you think that once you start to get a little bit more competition from bigger players in this space, or maybe folks that aren't even in the space right now, do you think that that investment, the money you have now and the investments you're making are going to be enough to fulfill those dual roles? 100%. It's a great question. Uh, we told our investors, we'll tell everyone today, we are mm -hmm. fully funded based on the proceeds of our IPO, mm -hmm. so we can make the investments, we can get to profitability. Uh, I said this this morning um, on the earnings call, um, profitability for us is a managed outcome. If we pulled back on growth, we could be profitable tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We don't think that's a smart trade. We do think as we, you know, we have a seven year head start on any co competition, we might get eight or nine years, but we probably aren't gonna get 15 years. So for us, it's a land grab. We want to get to as many markets with as many uh, um, category changing technology platforms as possible. We have the bike, we have the tread, we will have future products in the coming years. And we're very excited about, about those investments. Jamaica had a banner 2018 as the world's best performing stock exchange. The island's main index outperformed all 94 national benchmarks tracked by Bloomberg. And that meteoric rise has not let up this year. The Jamaican stock exchange is up 30% year to date, just as the IMF says the country's economy is looking healthier than ever before. We talked about that track record with the stock exchange's managing director, Marlene Street Forrest, and asked her what was the secret to their success. Is really to do with the economy. You know that we are stable and um, persons are optimistic about Jamaica. The business people, the consumers, we are optimistic about what is going on in Jamaica. And 
over those couple of years, what we also have been doing is encouraging Jamaican companies to do better in terms of their corporate governance, training, etc. So we have been putting in the hard work for the companies to perform well, and uh, um, it is paying dividend. Uh, I just looked, there's no Jamaica ETF, and I'm curious if there's a lot of interest from outside of uh, Jamaica to more easily be able to invest in the country and whether that is something that may be in the works, more vehicles for international investors to easily invest in your stock market. So Sagicor has just launched an ETF. Oh, there is? Yes. So th there was one just launched about two or three months ago. Okay. It's not d directly called ETF, but it does the Got same it. thing. Um, until FSC does its the total work in, in respect to the regulations. So we are moving in that direction. As a result of that too, we have just really um, put in two new indices. So we have had um, in the last six months the financial index mm -hmm. and also the manufacturing and distribution index. All of that in anticipation of mm. really doing more ETFs. What type of interest are you seeing from uh, foreigners uh, with regards to investing in Jamaica? It is growing mm -hmm. very rapidly, which is why, too, we are here in uh, New York and we were just in Canada because people are curious, people are seeing the results as uh, shown by the index. But more so, what is happening is that when you look on how the companies themselves are performing, they are performing well. Mm -hmm. um, th there is a dividend payout, there is a, the stock price appreciation. So overall, we are doing pretty good. And as you know, the stock exchange is really a barometer of the economy. Mm. I'm just digging, digging into the outperformers, the individual stocks here. Barita Investments up 410% in the last 12 months. The exchange itself is yes. traded, and you've done rather well, up at 180%. Yes. Radio Jamaica, Caribbean, Cement. What sectors really outperform in Jamaica? In Jamaica? Um, we have the banking sector that is doing well. Um, the manufacturing sector is also doing well. And the well, the banking and finance is doing well. So those sectors are doing well. And what we also have now in terms of the junior market, because we do have a junior market and a main market, mm -hmm. and the junior market all sectors, companies from all sectors are actually coming in um, to be listed on the exchange. So when we look at some of the companies that, that were just on the screen there, yes. that were popping up on the screen here, I mean, it's a pretty diversified mix. And yes. I mean, one of the knocks on a lot of uh, uh, economies in the Caribbean and in that part of the world is the lack of diversification. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, what what is sort of the thread that got you to this point where you have this kind of diversification in your economy, in your market this way? Okay. I mean, what did you do right, I so guess? What we did yeah. in terms of companies, we did not cherry pick. Mm -hmm. So the stock exchange really went out and instead of being order takers, because mm -hmm. most stock exchange are order takers, people come into them when they are ready. We actually went out to companies and we say, you have a good company here. Why not look to equity capital as against debt? Because a couple of years ago, the debt... Um, interest rate was very high and really what that did was stagnate many companies so we really had an opportunity to say to companies look look at debt look, look at equity as against debt many companies were afraid of doing that because one of the things that they feel many times because most of our companies are small and medium sized they think that if they do that they immediately lose their company our message had to be on target to say no. There is a regulation that 20% must be in the hands of 100 shareholders. They still have 80% of their company. So we went out and we spoke with companies. We also engaged IDB in terms of um, putting on a program that says um, access to finance, to equity capital. And we went out and we looked at for these companies mm -hmm. and we actually worked with them mm -hmm. to come to market. So it's more mm -hmm. order making as against order taking. You're still running your business on QuickBooks? More like quicksand. The bigger your company grows, the faster you sync with outdated software. Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program. That's special financing at netsuite.com slash earnings. netsuite.com slash earnings. Then we spoke with Bruce Linton, the co-founder and former CEO of Canopy Growth. 
Bruce is now the executive chairman of Vireo Health, a multi-state U.S. medical cannabis company. Shares of the Minneapolis-based company soared on the news that he was joining the firm. We started by asking him about what it was like switching gears and working for a U.S. cannabis company as opposed to a Canadian one. Well, thank you for calling it leaving. That's very nice. It's like, <laughs> I know, you said... a, it's like getting thrown out of a bar and somebody say you chose to left. But yeah, I get it. You said you've qualified it as uh, fired from Canopy Growth. What? But it, as part of your yeah. firing departure, yeah. uh, you signed a non-compete clause preventing you from working with Canadian cannabis companies. Right. So you're now working with American cannabis companies. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about how you adapt to working for a U.S. cannabis company when federal leg- legalization is unlikely in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I'm not sure you're going to see... Um, federal legalization where they say everything everywhere is on but I would be very surprised if by the end of 2020 you don't see something that's either states rights where they say whatever is going on in you know New York State uh, whatever they've approved at the state level is fine Uh, maybe you'll see medically uh, nationally introduced so um, working in the US though it comes down to the question is what's the company up to Mm. are they focused on science are they doing clinically responsible things so when you talk about jewel and the vape part of the reason I was attracted to Vireo is it's like scientists that are adults with a medical degree start a cannabis business. And then when they issue vapes and sell them, they track them in a post-market surveillance basis for the last four years mm-hmm. in at least two of the states to see if did anyone have an adverse reaction. The reason I like that is if you have the data, you have a defensible position. Their data says they're safe in terms of there haven't been reported incidents for their products, which says to regulators what you should really do is regulate aggressively so people move to the control product, not try to ban them. And so that's the kind of thing I'm looking for, and I was very happy to find in Vireo. Fascinating that they're monitoring. How, yeah. how are they monitoring the vapes yeah. once they're out in the open? So what you do is you, you take a third party whose job is to take inputs and receive it, and you have a registration process so that if you have an adverse reaction reported to the company or follow-up checkups, it goes through and a third party holds the data. So this is just like if you introduce the new version of any other product that people would buy as a medical and or I'll call it over the uh, shelf counter container uh, consumer. And so what you end up with is a situation where they've been responsible. Mm. And when you do that in one thing, you know what they do in the other areas, they file patents. So they have 15 quite broad patents filed and they have one that's issued and the one that's issued sort of looks at how could you make smoking cigarettes and tobacco less dangerous. Really what I liked about it was it's intellectual property that can cause a conversation. Mm -hmm. So my canopy life, Part of the reason I wanted to buy a company in the space, say, of you know, hair, shampoo, and, and face creams that was doing quite well called uh, This Works, was that if you were then going to add CBD to it and you wanted to have a good conversation with a really big company, you had a bargaining chip. And so I think they've been very astute in creating bargaining chips. And so that's going to yield well over the next three or four quarters as we decide who we buy, how we finance, and where we accelerate. Okay, so that's the plans for the yep. company right now. You mentioned aggressive regulating. Um, your, what's your read on what the FDA is thinking on vaping is? Because everyone's waiting for it to publish some kind of flavor yeah. guidance, right? Does it curb flavors or does it allow menthol cartridges and pods and other possible flavors to, to stay in the market? Well, you know, it's, it's a really tough spot. And, and the way I would look at it is whatever they disallow, they essentially say the criminals should provide. And so it's not that you can eliminate it. The question is, how do you actually enforce regulation at point of sale? And so I would hope what they do is they start to look at both the device and the flavoring. Mm -hmm. Because many of the devices are made in a way that the batteries and the flow line where it's a very heated product and now you've got it flowing over a battery and you're bringing stuff in Uh that I wouldn't think is a very sound approach. And then they should also really regulate what's in the tobacco and the cannabis CBD ones. And the reason they have to regulate is so you get CBD oil and you're vaping that. You say, well, it's only CBD. Well, no, it's not. Was the CBD harvested from crops that were regulated? Was there a spray applied to it? Are there other things in it? So I think the regulators have to go from the field to the device and don't ban, but really enforce regulations that say you can, maybe they limit flavor for a while. But um, the worst thing they'll do is say, we're not allowing it because that's just, you know, the criminals say thank you. You leave it for everyone else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. listen, prohibition, I think we've proven, is a very ineffective tool. Um, at least in the countries I work in, and uh, it's about 16 of them, every time that they've prohibited it, and and then they start rolling it back, and I meet someone who's upset, I say, well, the only reason you could be upset is presumably you're a criminal or someone in your family is a criminal because the only people who lose money under a regulated environment are the criminal aspects. And so hopefully on vapes they don't cede it to them. Let's talk about where you've gone now. Virio, of course, yep. executive chairman. You've already got the branding on your T-shirt. <laughs> uh, you sprinkle fairy dust wherever you go, Bruce. You've got a huge pop in the share price of Virio the minute that they announced that you're coming on as executive chairman. You've also been lending your name to Better Choice, CBD, yep. um, Animal Pet Food. That's going to be uh, your special advisor there. 
How do you ensure that this remarkable move, the light that you shine on these businesses, actually shows up in their performance and, and what you hope to bring to the company? So I, I first made a grid. I want to be able to see what happens to four-legged mammals. I want to be in a single-state operator, a multi-state operator. And I, I made my grid and I filled it in. And then I made a deal with everybody in the company. I said, guys, um, good, I'm going to join, but nobody sells stock for the next year hmm. in the key players. So No insider selling. Right. If you're a key player, don't sell. And I hope the stock pops the first day because you'll go, oh, I like that. And then what you got to do is say, I, I really like that. I better work hard tomorrow and the next day. And before you know it, the stock's way better off. And you've gotten used to working hard and not selling. And so it was kind of like one of those terms I dropped in at the end because I, I'm not selling and I don't want to stand around and have nobody with me. And so I think, that, um, I think that's a first step towards succeeding and creating value is you need to stay with your stock if you're inside working. Does it make you quite smug that you get these share price reactions and you were fired? It's the first time I've actually been popular. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, 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 I'm fond of that. But I think that the reason I'm popular is I try to structure it so that people who invest don't have to look at it every day and trade it every day. Yeah. What they have to decide is, did it pop and will it drop and should I buy a bit more later? But when you're going to have a conversation about what are the three MSOs that you have to own in the event that the U.S. election results in some kind of change to the regulatory framework, Vario is going to be there. And that's the point of the exercise. And betting on inclusive firms. These days, that means compiling an index made up of 100 companies that support equality for the LGBTQ community. The LGBTQ100 ESG Index is the first environmental, social, and governance benchmark to seek constituent input for its makeup. Scarlett sat down with Billy Bean. He's the current Major League Baseball Vice President and the league's first ambassador for inclusion to talk about Billy's journey as one of the first openly gay MLB players and what prompted him to join the initiative. I played in the big leagues and I was living basically a double life hiding that uh, I'm gay and and uh, my what happened was it sort of facilitated I thought I was managing that secret uh, in 150 years of Major League Baseball only at that time not even had happened yet but only two players have ever publicly disclosed that they are gay that have played in the major leagues I didn't know that I was one of those two people at the time um, because I never intended on sharing that story but my what happened was I was navigating that double life and but my partner died suddenly the night before uh, what was my last season and I had never come out to my family or a teammate or friends and uh, it was before the internet and and uh, it seemed like a lonely dark place to be and I just walked out on my own career and I was outside of baseball and then uh, you know my story somehow uh, came out as I started to get back into the business world and the uh, LGBTQ community came calling uh, because there are so few role models in the especially in men's team sports at that time it was 1999 and Diane Sawyer did a huge uh, story about me and it was on the cover of the New York Times when that meant uh, you know that was a big deal at the time and I never thought I would be an influencer in this space, and it wasn't until I started to uh, really lift, you know, the living in shame and afraid. You know, I was a product of baseball and the oldest of five uh, boys, and my dad was a military man, very mm -hmm. religious family, and um, believed all of those old antiquated stereotypes and things. And, and for me, uh, slowly but surely, as I got to know uh, more and more people and became uh, my best self and, you know, stopped uh, denying all the things that are true, mm -hmm. uh, I started to meet a lot of people that really influenced me and I got involved. And over the last 20 years, um, was really um, active in the uh, LGBT community. And then about five or six years ago, uh, baseball called me. They and called you. They called me. I never thought even up until 2013 that uh, there would be a place for a gay man, even a former Major League Baseball player. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, they, through the great leadership in that sport wanted to expand their workplace protection, anti-harassment, non-discrimination policies, and include sexual orientation. And that really started the conversation mm -hmm. um, of a former player talking to uh, players at that time. And baseball's really been leading the way, and I'm proud to say, um, understanding our uh, social responsibility in the world um, as a leader, the sport of Jackie Robinson, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, trying to change a culture that is you know, over 100 years in the making for, uh, and in the sports world is a, a very influential place, especially sure. for young males, you know, when we are, uh, digest all those stereotypes and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the way uh, boys think what's funny. Um, so we've worked really hard and it's great. 
And to be clear, you don't just talk to players who are current and active in MLB. You also talk to uh, kids and in the baseball community. We have well, tremendous, yeah, tremendous youth programming, obviously age appropriate, trying to uh, create well-rounded citizens and uh, the, share the values of baseball. Mm -hmm. And uh, but definitely talk to front offices, uh, ask to speak around corporate America to they want to know what baseball is doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I am an ambassador of my sport and uh, proud to do so. But uh, um, the conversation uh, just continues and continues to grow. And I think that that really leads into this amazing opportunity that we have with the LGBT uh, loyalty holdings company. OK, so let's talk about that a little bit, because you hooked up with Barney Frank, the former congressman. Yep, dear friend of mine for 20 years. Yep. And you guys are working on this together, the LGBTQ plus loyalty index. Uh, it's an index for now, but eventually it will become an index fund and then an ETF as well. Right. Right now it's a, a, a methodology and media company that mm -hmm. uh, uh, is quantifying information that uh, aligns uh, uh, corporate America, the companies that are advancing equality with the LGBT community and our allies. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the goal of the index fund is to really be a groundbreaking resource uh, for people in the LGBT community, my community, and our allies to uh, allow them to express their preferences and their loyalties. I think that, uh, you know, the world sometimes doesn't move as fast as we would like to. And, you know, we're sitting on the Supreme Court making a decision, nine people, to decide whether uh, we can have workplace protections based on the uh, definition of the word sex from 1964 and the yeah. Title VII 1964 Equality Act, or Civil Rights Act. Um, we're waiting for, you know, the Equality Act sitting in the Senate. Um, for 100 people to make that determination. But I think this is where um, our outreach to the LGBTQ uh, uh, plus community is groundbreaking because we're going to be asking them. We're going to hand deliver uh, the methodology of finding that screening process of information of companies that get an A plus and then listen to what their life experiences, the LGBTQ community. And uh, hopefully that will be an informational resource along with the website of the company that uh, will create alliance in corporate America and be that resource back and forth. Now, obviously, you talk to a lot of company executives, um, potentially some of the companies that would be in this index. Do you also talk to investors? I, I wonder what kind of demand there is for this product and how they plan to use it in their portfolios. Well, the, the, the really interesting and wonderful ex learning experience for me is the whole ETF world. And uh, I've got to know Robert Toll uh, incredibly well over the last uh, five or six months. Andrew Channon is mm -hmm. another global influencer in this space. And because of the index uh, methodology, um, the business model of us uh, putting together a fund of uh, corporations that uh, advance equality uh, seemed very valuable in their minds. I, I am no expert. I'm not, uh, you know, uh, allowed to really talk about you know money it's not my space but trying to be the communicator between the information and the voice um, and allow my community to voice with their dollars and that where they want to uh, put their uh, income and and uh, their preferences and I think that we uh, are going to be knocking on the door of something that should be a wonderful opportunity for a lot of people when you talk to company executives are they asking you about the criteria and how they can be included what they can do specifically to make sure that they're included, that they get a high rating, high grade, so that they're well, part of the Well, that's based 100% on their activity. Mm -hmm. And it's not, there's, this is not an opportunity for them to buy into or, you know, that it is going to be third party um, uh, screening process that is a, you know, many different uh, variables that uh, entail that. But I think what we will do down the road, um, and this is a perfect example that I, from my own experience, is that one of the ways, um, as the one out person in Major League Baseball, when I came back, um, th even on the business side, was to create an environment where we had a chance to provide resources and a learning process. And right. I think that it's it's easy to assume that corporate America, and thankfully, they have led the way in advancing equality for women, you know, mm -hmm. in the 70s and 80s, and then, you know, for LGBT community, you know, great, great companies out there. But um, to follow like that model of an employee resource group or business resource groups where you have people that uh, have, have life experiences that, um, allow for, you know, sharing and, and not so much uh, a, 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 like 
this is the right thing to do type of you know preaching mm -hmm. mentality. Mm -hmm. I think that we can um, not only see from the front row uh, the commitment to advancing quality of corporate America uh, or specific publicly traded companies, but um, be a part of the process of, of leading them into a place where we can be a uh, resource and influencer for them. And that's it for What You Missed This Week. If you like the show, make sure to subscribe and rate us at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can catch our show every weekday from 3.30 to 5 p.m. on Bloomberg TV and from 4 to 5 p.m. on Twitter. Thanks for listening and have a great week. This year could be a critical moment for climate finance. How far has Wall Street come in addressing net zero transitions? How has interest in sustainability driven fixed income investment? Join Bloomberg Live in a Monday on May 25th for the future of sustainable investing, a decisive year for ESG. To hear from senior industry leaders as they discuss how financial services are planning to fight global warming, visit BloombergLive.com slash sustainable investing radio to learn more.